Chapter 22 Yadmund, king of East Anglia, woke up before the rest of the household. He had not been sleeping well. He thought about going back to sleep, but he was restless. The Mercians would be here soon. Yadmund surveyed his feasting hall, filled with sleeping warriors. Some stirred at his footsteps, though others slept so soundly they might as well have been dead. He had just under two hundred men, though only twenty-two managed to fit in his hall. The rest were camped nearby in tents or billeted with the locals. He stepped carefully around the bodies and walked outside. The sun was not up yet, but the eastern sky was light. He had captured Ipswich quickly last winter. The Mercian thane who had controlled the area hadn't been expecting an attack, and there were fewer than twenty soldiers defending the town. As Yadmund had stormed through the town with his soldiers, killing or capturing his opponents, he had felt the rush of the battle fill him with strength and courage, though looking back he realized that it wasn't a real battle, not the kind that decided the fate of kingdoms. That would come later, when King Cohen Wolf of Mercia heard that East Anglia was no longer content to live under his rule. Cohen Wolf would never permit it, Yadmund knew, and he spent the winter visiting local lords and planning his defense. The attack had come after the frost had thawed, and Yadmund received word that Mercian troops were burning villages along the north coast. It was meant to draw him out, of course, but Yadmund was looking forward to the fight, and he wasn't about to let his villages burn. He had been waiting in Ipswich with fifty men, but now was the time to gather his forces, and he sent word to his thanes that it was time for battle, and they joined him as he marched north. Some of them. Almer and three other thanes never met up with him, and when he reached the opposing army, he found why. Almer's banner stood among the Mercian line. The Mercians had about two hundred men, which wasn't much more than Yadmund had. Cohenwolf wasn't there. Mercia was also fighting Northumbria. The timing was perfect for Yadmund, for Cohenwolf had clearly not sent his whole army. If the traitors hadn't changed sides, the numbers would have been equal. Yadmund should have been furious, but he was mostly hurt. He had counted on Almer and the other thanes, and now they were lined up against him. That was Yadmund's first real battle, and he had conducted himself well, he thought. The two lines, about fifty men shoulder to shoulder and three or four men deep, lined up and put their circular shields together, overlapping them to lend strength, then moved in close. The lines maneuvered a bit, trying to keep the sun at their back and trying to draw the other side out. Edmund had been packed in the middle of them, shouting orders. When the two lines were a spear's length apart, they started taking shots at each other, but neither wanted to close the distance. A couple Mercians charged and tried to break the line, but Yadmin's men stood fast and fought them off. Then, without Yadmund even giving an order, the two lines of shields rushed each other and clashed with a deafening clatter. Men were shouting and cursing, and swords and spears thrust past shields and helmets, looking for an opening. Yadmund looked for Almer occasionally during the clash, but couldn't get a good look at him. Then, with a great groaning sound as if sea ice were fracturing, the Mercian line fell apart and the East Anglians were able to roll over them. Some Mercians turned and ran back to their horses, but they weren't fast enough. Every Mercian was captured or killed that day, and Yadmin lost only fifty men. It was a victory. Afterward, Yadmin went looking for Almer, hoping to find him among the prisoners, but eventually found his body among the scattered dead. Yadmin, now looking at the rising sun and contemplating the battle ahead, thought back to that day. He wished he could have confronted Almer, though he couldn't think what he would have said. Would he have made him beg? It didn't matter. Almer lay among the fallen, and that was the end of it. After that first battle, Yadmund had set about readying himself for what he knew was coming. Cohen Wolf wouldn't let this rest, and another army, a bigger one, would come eventually. Until then, he rewarded his thanes and set about recruiting more men. He thought about establishing a position on the border with Mercia so that he could keep Cohen Wolf's soldiers away from his farms and villages, but it took a lot of food and a bit of silver to keep soldiers happy and ready to fight. There was nowhere he could support his army except his estate at Ipswich, and even now, five months later, he was worried about running low on bread and beer. For that reason, the Mercian troops that were now approaching had managed to get only days away before any news got to him. They hadn't been stopping to pillage. They were going straight for him, the king, hoping to finish him before reinforcements could arrive. 
Are you well, my lord? the admin's steward asked. I am, thank you, Stanmar, he said. Truly, his stomach was in knots, and he was struggling to keep his breathing under control. The two men paused to watch the sun rise. The messenger said they would arrive today or tomorrow, he continued. I sent another scout to report back. Any news from the south? Not yet, my lord, said Stanmore. Your earldom and Dunstan is on his way with thirty-five, but they were ten miles away as of last night. Let me know when they arrive, said the young king, and he walked off, tensing his muscles to keep from shaking. Gunhild rode up to the wooden pier. It was late morning, and there were people about. Nevertheless, there seemed to be a hush in the air. She had skipped Ipswich two weeks ago when she passed this way going south, though she made a mental note of the River Orwell where it emptied into the sea. Now, returning back from Doristad, it seemed a good place to try to unload her cargo of wine, if she could find a buyer. Ipswich had no walls. Like Yoverwich, it straddled a river, and a bridge connected the two parts. A short ten miles from the sea, easy to access but protected from the waves, it was perfect for trading. Houses in the English style, low and triangular, were mixed with tents and small gardens and pens, but Gunhild could see both a wooden church and the hall of some great lord. This could be the perfect place. She tied the boat to the dock and hopped out and looked for someone in charge. A bearded man with a belt cinched low under his belly walked up to her. Be well, she greeted him. Is this Ipswich? It is, said the man. It's a penny to trade here. I don't know that I want to trade yet, said Gunhild. Who is the lord here? May I see him? These are King Edmund's lands, said the man. He is here, but it's his steward you want to see. However, it's still a penny to dock. Gunhild grudgingly handed over her last piece of silver. She had managed to spend very little, but she had to pay the same fee when she was in Dorstad, and she had also bought some supplies there, rope, candles, and a needle and thread. She hoped the wine would fetch a good price. She left the wine in the boat while she went to find the king's steward. The day was overcast and cool, but even that didn't account for the lack of activity she saw. It might be Sunday, she thought. She had lost all track of the days and wasn't sure. Gunhild approached the king's hall, and when she saw the number of soldiers around it, she realized that something big was going on. Some soldiers were dressed in chainmail with helmets and shields, but a number of them looked more like farmers armed only with spears. Most of the soldiers were sitting around talking or tending to their equipment, but two stood on either side of the front door of the hall, spears upright, so she addressed them. "'Be well,' she said. "'I'm looking for the steward.' "'He is busy,' said one of the guards. "'What is your business?' "'I'm a merchant,' said Gunhild. "'I have wine,' she added, hoping this might attract the guard's interest, or at least lighten the mood. "'He might be free later,' said the guard. "'You'll have to wait.' Gunhild decided that she didn't want to argue, so she thanked the guard and began to walk around the town. It was nearly as big as the Overwitch, though there were few people selling anything at the moment. She noticed a few large brick ovens and realized they were pottery kilns. Gunhild continued exploring, making a big loop around the houses and tents, and back to her boat. Later she returned to the hall, and the guards recognized her. "'He is around back,' said one of them. "'Name's Stanmar. Bald fellow.' She thanked them and went looking. So far as she could tell, Stanmar was in the middle of berating a young boy about something to do with the tack for the horses, but she had trouble following what he said. Everywhere she went in England seemed to have a different accent, and that made it all the more difficult for her. "'Be well,' she said. "'Are you Stanmar, the king's steward?' "'I am,' he said tersely. "'Who are you?' "'My name is Gunhild,' she said. "'I bring fine wine from the Rhone, good wine for the tables of bishops and kings.' Maybe you will have a cup to see if it is liked by the good King Edmund. She had prepared this pitch earlier and was rather proud of it. Stanmar considered the proposal. They hadn't had wine in a while, as the king was trying to save money. It was all he could do to extract bread and meat from his farms in order to feed the soldiers, and there wasn't much silver around. How much do you have? he asked. Seven barrels, said Gunhild. They are ten silver pennies each. For ten pennies they'd better be good, said the steward. He considered the fact that the enemy soldiers were even now marching toward Ipswich, and a battle was inevitable. King Yadmund would either be victorious, in which case he would want to rejoice with wine, or he would be defeated, in which case he would be dead or captured, and there would be no point in having saved money. Furthermore, Stanmar himself would possibly be dead, or at the very least out of a job, so there was no reason to save the king's silver now. Seventy pennies for seven barrels,' said Stanmar. "'I'll have two of the boys help you with the barrels. They'll meet you at the pier.' 
Gunhild couldn't believe her luck. Within half an hour she had the barrels unloaded and waiting by one of the outbuildings behind the king's hall. The steward was off doing something else by the time the two boys had finished with the last barrel, so she sat on top of the barrels, guarding them, waiting for her payment. It was only a few minutes later that a horn echoed through the village, and a cry went up among the people that the Mercians had been spotted and were approaching fast. Gunhild realized, as people around her grabbed weapons, saddled horses, shouted orders, or ran for cover, that the steward might not come back to pay her for a while. The sound of the horn was a relief to Yadman. Although he felt his stomach clinch and his heart start to pound, he was glad that the waiting was over. He sent a boy to fetch his horse and turned to the messenger. How far out? he asked. Less than an hour, said the messenger, out of breath. Bjortstan, shouted the king. Any sign of Dunstan? Not yet, my lord, replied a man nearby. Edmund took the reins of his horse and mounted. Assemble at the edge of town. Bjortstan, see to the archers. Alfwig with me. Let's go. Outside of the town, Eadmund dismounted and began arranging his thanes and their troops. He sent riders to check on the Mercians' progress and worked at predicting where they would approach and how best to confront them. Scouts put the number of the enemy at three hundred or more. Even with Dunstan's extra men, they would have been at a disadvantage. He gathered some of his more experienced thanes and asked for their advice. "'Move in quickly,' said Alfwig, a large man and a seasoned fighter. "'As soon as you see them. They've been walking all day. They'll be hoping for a rest.' They might even try to talk first. Don't let them. We have twenty archers, said another. Start shooting as soon as they're in range. Make them get their shield wall in position while they're under fire. They could do nothing but wait now. For Eadmund it was agony. He was acutely aware of the weight of his chainmail and the way his boots pinched. His helmet, which had never bothered him before, now seemed not to quite sit right. He started to feel strangely guilty about asking his men to stand waiting, as if he were inconveniencing them. I'm king, he reminded himself. They're doing their duty. Be sure you do yours. He knew this would have been a good time for some inspiring words, and he thought about stepping forward and saying something about courage and glory, but he couldn't focus. I didn't lack words when I stood by Almer and praised his loyalty, he thought. He began to stew upon Almer's betrayal, but a shout from afar told him the approaching army had been spotted. A war cry from his own men filled the air, and some began to bang their sword pommels against their shields. Yadmin joined the roar and the banging, and he and his army watched as the Mercians came into view on the horizon. He watched them approaching in the distance, waiting as they came into focus. He could start to make out individual details of the men in front. Then he realized that he needed to start giving orders. Suddenly he couldn't think what to do. His mouth was dry, and he was keenly aware of the smell of his own sweat. He found it strange that he happened to be here, standing in a field, on this particular day, with these men, and even stranger that soon people would be trying to kill him. The Mercian troops continued to get closer, and he thought again that his helmet didn't sit right, and wished he could stop the impending battle to fix it. "'Shields up, my lord,' murmured Alfwig in his ear, and Yadmin heard himself bellow, "'Shields up!' as if someone else was saying it. "'Archers ready!' he called. "'Forward, and keep the line!' As his men started to march forward and their footsteps fell into a slow cadence, Yadmin forgot about his helmet entirely. The pieces were on the board now, and he was ready to move. The Mercian troops had appeared along the river, and if Yadmin came at them from the side, he could put the river at their back. Move right, he called, and the line obeyed. The Mercians had stopped their march and were now forming up their own line. Come at them from the north, Yadmin called. Drive them into the river. Archers, fire as soon as they're in range. Everything was going smoothly now. Edmund could see in his mind how it would play out. There was no more fear. Everything came into focus. Arrows from the Mercian side hit some of his own men, and he decided to finish things quickly. Shield wall, he called, and the men in front began to overlap their shields and settle into formation. Up and down the line, his thanes were shouting encouragement to the men around them. Forward, quick now, he ordered, and the distance began to close. He could see the Mercians' faces clearly now, and within seconds the two shield walls stood a spear's length apart, and his army halted its advance. The two lines did not crash together, but kept just out of distance as the spearmen who stood behind the shields tried to reach the men on the other side. Spear tips flashed as they shot out quickly in return, while the men holding shields ducked and batted spears and arrows away with their swords. 
Some hurled curses and insults at each other. Yadmin stood roughly at the center of his army, four men back from the shield wall, trying to keep track of what was going on on all sides of him. Suddenly a dozen men from the Mercian line rushed forward and slammed into the opposing shields. Hold together! came a shout. Forward! Push! called someone else. The words were hard to pick out in the cacophony of yelling and injured screams. The East Anglian line held, and the Mercians who had charged were cut down and lay now on the ground between the two armies. Think we can punch through, Alfwig? Edmund asked. We could try a boar snout, said Alfwig. Let's split them down the middle, said Yadmund. I'll lead it, said Alfwig, pushing through the other soldiers to stand near the front. Boar snout, he shouted. Form up on me! Lock your shields! Alfwig put himself at the point of a triangular formation as the men around him overlapped their shields on both sides, forming a wedge. Some locked their arms around each other's waists or shoulders and hunched behind their shields, waiting for the command. Now, shouted Alfwig, and the East Anglian line parted to let the charge through. No one stopped to swing a sword. They barreled forward like a ram, splitting the Mercian shield wall and trampling over anyone who got in the way. The rest of Yadmin's men followed, and the Mercians found themselves knocked back and disorganized. The fighting was furious now, as everyone came shield to shield, crushed together by the men behind them. Swords and spears thrust through any available space looking for a weak spot. Slowly the Mercians fell back, and Yadmin found himself stepping over bodies as his men continued to drive forward. Perfect, he thought. We've got them divided and scattered. Now to tighten up and keep up the pressure. Yadmin's men pushed deeper into the enemy ranks, and he looked quickly over his shoulders to make sure the rest of his army was following. He saw that the Mercians were fighting to reconnect their front line. Instead of scattering, the Mercian troops had encircled the East Anglian shield formation, and the admin watched as his small contingent was cut off at the back. He was now in a bubble surrounded on all sides, isolated from the rest of his army. He stood encircled by shields, his men packed tightly, making it harder for them to maneuver. Shouts surrounded him. He knew he should give an order, but he couldn't think what. He saw his warriors fall as spears flashed over the tops of the shields. He looked for Alfwig and couldn't see him. The spear tips were coming closer to him as his own men, crushed together by the force of the surrounding bodies, tried to back up. He wanted to say push back, but he had no words. More men fell and the circle got smaller, and Yadmin felt a brief moment of panic before a sharp pain pierced his side under his sword arm. He fell to his knees and pitched forward, and his last thought was simply, No. No.